The bathrooms are outside on the left. And we will be having a bar stool meeting. So if you're feeling like some beer and pizza and maybe a cold drink, uh, join us at Flames. You're all welcome to come and sit down and talk more about uh, what we're hearing tonight and explore some different ideas. Oh, it's the end of the semester, guys. You all look a little stressed. Is it the exams, the papers? Graduate students, are you worried about those comprehensive exams coming up pretty soon? I know that the faculty push you because we actually compete to be the one who pushes you the most. So we call it challenging. And we challenge you because we see so much in you that is amazing. You guys uh, do so much work in your home life, in your work life, at school, that uh, I don't know how to tell you that we see that you can be future leaders, entrepreneurs, policy makers. And I was wondering just a few minutes ago, do you see that in yourselves? Do you see how amazing we see you are? I hope you do, because there are other people here today who really do invest in you. And I'd like to introduce one of our donors right now who sees an incredible future that you guys have in front of you. Will Phil come on up to the stage? Phil Lebhertz is a health insurance pioneer whose work has expanded coverage to Americans. He has been working in the field of health insurance benefits for over 30 years. He founded LISI in 1977 with a staff of five in a small office in San Mateo, California. Today, LISI is the premier agency for group health in California and serves thousands of brokers from six fully staffed offices statewide. In 2004, the Foundation for Health Coverage Education, a nonprofit organization, uh, was founded with the mission to simplify public and private health insurance eligibility to provide information in order to help more people access coverage. Simplified health coverage, geez, we need that. <laughs> so Phil's expertise in healthcare has made him a critical voice in the national conversation on healthcare reform. His input on the healthcare debate, the uninsured and group health trends are featured regularly in numerous healthcare publications and media, including the Wall Street Journal, ABC News, Washington Post, and CNN. Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Leberhertz is somebody who invests in you. Thank you. Does this go in here? Let's see. Boink. Okay. I invest in you. I like that, actually. So that was actually what they asked me to talk about right now. Why would I invest in, in San Jose State University Economics Department. And I have to say that if you observe, if you're me, uh, I'm a guy who went to Chico State, so I'm right there at right the same level, you know. And uh, I had, I, I dreamed about success, whatever that is. And one of the things I found out is that you will become what you think about. So think about it, right? It's not, it's not just thinking about it. You have to be willing to learn it, fight the fight, and take the risk. But if you truly believe something, whatever it is, you could be a professor, you could be an entrepreneur, you can be a person achieving whatever it is, you will become what you think about. So think about good things. So why did I do this? Oh, look, that was actually there. I thought I was improvising. <laughs> Throughout history, in all the different countries out there, it's culture, individual rights, knowledge, and reward systems that have worked the best to raise up society. Communism, fascism, dictatorships, all of those things, if you look out throughout history, they failed. They create an elite top, and the bottom suffers. 
So we fought wars over all that. People died. You know, right from the start, one of the beautiful things about the U.S. is that when they came over, it was like a new market. The riches were here, but the people had to decide how they were going to manage it. And that's where we get the Bill of Rights and our Constitution. And these things really matter. Really matter. So when I start seeing people fighting against freedom of speech on campuses, that is scary to me. Because I love this country. I love the ability to be able to achieve. And I love the ability to be able to fail on my own. If you want to lose that, give up your freedom of speech. Let the government take over everything, and you'll find out what happens. But it's much less painful if you'll read history. Okay? Let's see here. Knowledge and reward systems of free societies have proven better than any alternative to raise the standard of living for everybody. The reason for the success of the free market system is that people gain by satisfying what other people's needs are. So in any industry, no matter what you're doing, you have to create value. And that's principle of entrepreneurship. I'm not getting into the fact that you have to have your integrity and all that. That's a given. If you don't have that, don't even start. But this is what makes free societies work. This creates harmony of interest and cooperation and by mutually benef benefiting society. If you're helping somebody do better and they're trading with you and you've created value and you're getting a profit, you both won. Free markets encourage win-win behavior. You get away from free markets, watch what happens. And we're, we're doing that as a country. That's why I invested in this. And I'm going to invest more across into other universities and stuff. But we've, our group has put out about 5,000 freedom-minded professors. We're not trying to brainwash you. We're teaching you this philosophy. You're going to choose whatever you want. But figure out what you believe in. That's what I would tell you. Know what you believe in. And then you put that in that dream or that vision that you have, and watch what happens. You cannot be stopped. Everybody in this room has been given the golden spoon. You're in a society and in a country. doesn't matter how you got here. doesn't matter if your family stayed together. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's only one person that that matters to, and it's you. You're going to make decisions that are going to affect your life and the lives of others. And you've got to go for it. It's important for these ideas and concepts are learned by each generation. Because as Ronald Reagan said, they're not passed on through your blood. We can lose this. And this is what I'm seeing. I've never seen anything like it. I, you know, A socialist, Bernie Sanders, gets that many votes when socialism fails everywhere? What are we thinking? What's, what's being taught in these schools? I stopped donating to other schools when I found out what they were teaching, that this is not good. These are concepts that ensure peace and prosperity through individual responsibility, and that's who we are. And that's why I invested. Okay, now for the fun part. Introducing Scott McNeely. He's quite a character. He's an icon in the Silicon Valley of entrepreneurs. Mr. McNeely was co-founder of Sun Microsystems in 1982. One of the things that I find so special is that he became CEO of Sun Microsystems in 1984 and was CEO till 2006. How long do CEOs last nowadays, right? And he took a, a, a concept and an idea and made it worldwide incredible. Scott is married, uh, <laughs> and he has four boys. And I can tell you that besides being a world-class businessman, he's also a world-class family man. I know his family. 
And I'll tell you what, the pr same principles, by the way, the principles work everywhere. Learn the principles. But he's made a lot of decisions in his life, a lot of big deals, a lot of everything. But the greatest transaction and the best decision he ever made was marrying his wife, Susan, who's here. And she's right there, so she's a very special lady. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce Scott McNeely. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate all of you uh, in the middle of your academic career here taking some time out to uh, listen to uh, a formerly famous and important Silicon Valley icon uh, talk about uh, what's going on in the world. Um, I only have less than an hour and a half to basically counteract. How many of you were born and raised in Cali California? Most of you. So I only have a I don't have to counteract the whole lifetime you've had of uh, media, mainstream media, Hollywood, tenured professors, government sector union teachers, and the California legislature kind of pushing you guys all in uh, the direction that Phil so clearly. We, I was listening to Phil and I said, when I got out of college, nobody had to give us a speech about that. It, it, it's actually scary that we have to explain that to people because maybe you haven't heard that before. Maybe you haven't heard that. I mean, it was sort of like default that capitalism was the way out of tyranny and that if you didn't have financial liberties and freedoms, you wouldn't have social and personal liberties and freedoms. That, I grew up understanding and knowing that. Now, most of you studying economics have probably figured that out a little bit uh, quicker than maybe some of the other um, disciplines that are being taught in schools around the world, but uh, certainly in America, it's been a kind of a kind of a shocker to me to see where we have come. And uh, I, I just, I, I think the reason Phil invited me is because I'm a raging capitalist. I'm proud of it. And uh, a little disappointed that Antifa wasn't outside protesting my showing up here to talk about <laughs> personal responsibility and accountability as a very, very important virtue. Uh, in all organizational processes that you would have in any community anywhere. Um, we're, to, to give you one statistic, just add up state, federal, and local uh, spending as part of GDP, and we're hurtling towards 50% of the GDP in the government sector. I grew up in Detroit in the auto industry. When Detroit had the largest per capita income of any metropolitan area in the United States, it isn't anymore. It's bombed out. Every third house is still standing. It's tragic. And you know what the number one per capita metropolitan area is in the United States? The Washington, D.C. area. That's what's happened in my lifetime. And it's sort of like getting boiled, a frog getting boiled in water by just turning up the heat. People don't see it and feel it. But trust me, it's very, very different. And trust me, California is strange weird. It is so strange weird. Especially, in, I don't know, just the metropolitan California areas. I grew up in the Midwest. I lived in Ashtabula, Ohio, Centralia, Illinois, Racine, Wisconsin, uh, Rockford, Illinois, all these places, Troy, Michigan. They're very, very different. I got the Michigan t-shirt over there, love it. Um, they're very, very different. The perspectives are very, very different. Uh, and it is a, just a, a reality distortion field around. So I just wanted to kind of, I can't move you er, as far as I'd like to move you in this hour and a half, but you can follow me on Twitter. I'm, I've left some cards on the desk. So if you'd like to engage uh, with me after uh, this talk, I'm happy to, to go do that. But uh, I think this is a very, very important message that needs to be uh, explained on campuses everywhere, which is why I was happy to take some time to go do that. Um, I would like to, I know a lot of you are trying to figure out how do you turn this economics degree into um, something you can sell to an employer uh, and, and make some money and 
raise a family and be self-sufficient and all those other wonderful uh, uh, things. I started off at, at Harvard at wanting to be a doctor, an eye doctor, and I just, I don't know why, I just thought that would be cool. And I saw that 60% of the class was already pre-med, and I thought, you know what, that's, there's plenty of doctors here, and there's a lot of really smart doctors here. So I said, I took an economics class, I loved it. It was a social science. It dealt with the psychology, philosophy, vagaries, and randomness of the human genome while also being scientific, econometric, statistical, uh, fact-based, uh, and, and logic-based. So I enjoyed the, the two sides and, and trying to figure out how to, because almost every decision you make in life is an emotional, social, as well as a analytical, logical decision process. And this was one of the, a lot of like art history sort of is all social and physics, there's not a lot of emotion in physics. So I, I really enjoyed the, both the left and right hand brain uh, environment of that. And I think as you get out in the real world, figuring out how to convince employers that you can think on both sides of your brain, that you're technical as well as um, human, I think it's going to be a very valuable uh, skill. And, and um, as you do your research projects and that sort of thing, uh, I think playing that off will resonate with a hiring manager quite nicely, that, uh, that you're not just a, a nerd and you're not just a gadfly on the other side. So, um, and I also wish that economics was a core requirement in your freshman year, micro and macro. I'm so tired of being interviewed by a mainstream media person who was in English class uh, their, their entire career and don't know what ROI, marginal rate of returns, diminishing returns, all of those other kinds of phrases are. Uh, uh, asset utilization. There's just so many things you learn and basic human nature, which they tend to forget. So uh, that's that's what I'd like to uh, see you all. Um, I, I want you to s survive and thrive out there in the, in the capitalist world because you're coming at it with a perspective that I think isn't taught in many other departments uh, in, in college. Um, there's a book called Accidental Empires I know a lot of you would like to go out and start a company and maybe be as successful as me. Beware. Um, if you're successful, you won't have any time to get married and have kids. I didn't get married till I was 39. Um, you, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to work 80, 90 hours a week. It is, it is not for somebody who wants to live a balanced life. I mean, you just can't because somebody's going to live in imbalanced life and kick your butt. So be ready. They don't tell you this in school, but I'm telling you this. You think you're working hard now? Well, if you want to go out and start a company and spend somebody else's money, and I recommend you use somebody else's money on your first startup, do not use your own. Go lose somebody else's like me who can live with the loss. Just don't, don't bet your nest egg on that. Um, but you're going to have to work harder than anybody else on the planet. And if you're the leader, you're going to have to work harder than every employee or they're not going to respect you. So you could have saved a lot of money on your, um, no, you can't. It's worth it. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try and tell you some of the things they might not teach you um, in, in college or even in an MBA. And what I learned is that it is accidental how you get there. I, I started off wanting to be a doctor, ended up doing economics. My first job after I, I was on the golf team, I majored in golf and minored in economics. And I hit one OB on the 16th hole and didn't make the NCAA championship. And I said to my dad, oh my gosh, I graduate in two weeks, I don't have a job. So he said, well, go call your old hockey coach. He's running um, plastics division at Rockwell International Automotive business and 
Troy, Michigan, and I called him and I said I need a job, so he sent me to Centralia, Illinois, and I got a job as a foreman in a UAW shop at the age of 21 uh, with people who are never going to leave that factory. Never. I mean, there is no upward mobility unless you can move from sanding and bonding Corvette hoods for the Corvette plant to a uh, tow truck driver, uh, forklift driver in the, uh, in the fact, I mean, that was like 30 year people who had been there for 30 years. I come in wearing a pinstripe suit, pink shirt, red tie. That lasted about one day. I didn't ever bring the suit back into the office. Um, and I moved on from there, did that for a couple of years, went and got a business, uh, MBA from Stanford, which is like learning golf by never hitting a ball, never playing around a golf. It's the most, let me save you some money to not get an MBA. It, if you're going to be a, ma a master's or a PhD in physics, you smash atoms. In chemistry, you Dr. Beaker. In uh, English, you actually read and write English. And if you are a doctor, you get on the gloves and you go invade. If you're an MBA, you don't raise money, spend money, you don't hire, review, or fire anybody, you don't make anything, you don't sell anything, you don't trade anything. You do none of that. You watch golf videos and go to the driving range and watch people hit balls and you caddy. And then two years later, they ask you to go out and play around the golf in front of everybody. It's really embarrassing. Uh, and that's the problem with the MBA. You can get you learn more in the first six weeks on it, and most of you know more than most MBAs know, just having worked while you're getting your your career. So, um, uh, I, I think I saved you all a little money with that piece of advice there. Um, so I came out of business school, went to I couldn't get a job in manufacturing. I love manufacturing because I like actually having a real live thing that you put in a box and ship to somebody and they get to open it. I didn't like finance because that's sort of like just brokering. Finance is brokering and brokers are liar, liar. A broker will always tell you that this is a great price to sell it and this is a great price to the other person. This is a great price to buy it. So they're lying to one or the other or both of you that this is absolutely the best price. And brokers also will get disintermediated every step along the way. We've been disintermediating brokers since TCPIP was invented. And so I didn't know that at the time. I just didn't want to be a broker. Um, I didn't want to be a lawyer because lawyers basically chop the pie up, hand it out, and take a chunk for themselves without actually growing the pie. Now, they're necessary, but, you know, what do you have if you line up all the lawyers uh, uh, across the ocean end to end? A good thing. So, <laughs> I had to throw a lawyer joke out there. I didn't want to be a lawyer, and I don't want to be in the government sector. I wanted to be in the private sector. But these are decisions you need to make. Uh, Phil said it right. You guys got to make a decision. Listen to people. But I liked being in the business that actually made things, provided actual goods and services that uh, you could you could actually feel good about. I also didn't want to be in the entertainment business. Um, I have a son right now who's in second stage qualifying in the web.com golf it's my oldest, first one out, and we had a long conversation about entertainment versus, uh, and, and I would always tell my boys, because more than one of them wants to be a pro golfer, I said, you know, the guy serving hamburgers at the halfway shack is actually adding more value than Tiger Woods. And the real problem with, and I, it's just stunning how much we pay entertainers. And in fact, when I found out how much Under Armour, KPMG and Callaway were willing to spend on my son. I said, be a pro golfer. <laughs> it is stunning to me how much we do to get, to, and, and what does a good entertainer do? They get you to absolutely not be non-productive, but to be negatively productive because you sit in the chair and you watch them and those that you all know what opportunity cost is. Those three hours you were sitting there watching are forever gone and you can't go do something productive 
And certainly there's enough things in this world that need to be fixed that I sort of feel f selfish watching TV or going to a hockey game, which I'm going to do proudly um, in about an hour. And, and I can't do too much of that. So, I, I'm, you know, the entertainment was not a space. Uh, a lot of people said, get into gaming. Really? I've actually funded some gaming startups and they get really successful. And I think about how many billions of hours are wasted doing this. My four boys were raised without any game console in the house. No TV or computers were allowed in their bedroom. And they had to do all of their study in the little tiny study where everybody could see what everybody had on their screen because we just didn't. They could watch golf and hockey on TV because I like golf and hockey, and that was it. We also did that one where they blow stuff up. What was that called? Uh, Mist Busters. That was, I like that, so I let them watch that. And the Three Stooges. So I think I've explained everything they were allowed to watch on TV. Um, so anyhow, you need to decide where and what you want to go do. Well, eventually, um, I was out here in California, and at San Jose, I got transferred out. Uh, to, I was working for FMC Corporation because I wanted to be in manufacturing. And they built a lot of stuff, and they put me on a project, a strategic project, out at the tank plant at San Jose where they made the M2 and M3 or whatever it was. Those of you who are shaking your head or giving your age away, but it's now a soccer stadium. What does that say? Went from making tanks to making soccer players. Um, and I fell in love with a girl on the project. It wasn't my wife, but I t went back to Chicago and said, I'm moving to California, either with you or without you. And so they transferred me out to the tank plant. And then I got a call. She left me. I worked too hard. But um, it's not important, is it? Um, um, I, I got a call from my college professor who was my economics, he's an economics PhD, he was my thesis advisor, all the rest of it. I actually wrote a thesis at Harvard on antitrust. I've actually read the Sherman Antitrust Act, which very few CEOs in the Valley have read. Um, and they were, they had a little company that was the first company to put Unix on a microprocessor and they couldn't build these things and they needed a manufacturing guy. So I went in there, I was 20, 25 or something like that. Everybody on the staff was 40 to 50 years old and been in the industry and they put me out on the line with all my, I had all manufacturing, purchasing and logistics under me. And I got the manufacturing manager reported to me, the guy who ran the line. I said, show me what these things are. He pulled the lid off of these, you know, kind of three high pizza box kinds of things. And I looked at it and I said, whoa, that's pretty cool. There was wires and chips and stuff everywhere. I said, what's that big black chip? And he goes, that's the CPU. I went, whoa, because at Stanford, they showed me the CPU being a refrigerator. I go, that little thing's a CPU? He goes, yeah. I go, what are all those other little black things? He says, those are DRAM. DRAM. What's DRAM? That's where memory is kept. Well, that's where data is stored. Like, what data? It goes to the operating system. Oh. Well, I didn't want to say what's an operating system. <laughs> so I go over to this thing and I say, all right, so what's that? He goes, that's the disk drive. I go, well, what's that thing spinning around? That's the platter. Well, what does that do? Well, that's where we store information. I go, what information? He goes, the operating system. I thought, I thought it was on the little black thing. And the guy's starting to get a little nervous about his new boss. <laughs> and then um, I said, well, what's that thing over there? And he says, that's the tape drive. No, he said, I, I put that thing. He goes, that's the power supply. Oh. And I go, this thing has batteries? He goes, no. It takes AC to DC power. And I go, oh, this thing goes both ways. He didn't think that was funny, but I, I, um, so then I said, what's that thing? And he says, that's the tape drive. And I said, no, this thing plays music. <laughs> and at that point, the guy literally took the cover, slammed it down over the top of the box, and it did not come out and stomped off to his office, did not come out for two weeks. I was 25, 26, didn't know it. I immediately enrolled at Mission College which you guys may or may know not, it's not all one And I started taking AC and DC theory. 
and started taking computer classes and stuff at night to learn what to do. I solved about $3 million inventory problem through basic dumb logic and I got everybody, I actually held a staff meeting and I asked people, the one, the one most important question you can ever, just write this one down and ask it 10 times a day in your job with everybody you run into, customers, employees, bosses, subordinates, whatever. If you were me, what would you be doing differently so that I could be doing better for you in my job? That's a question I asked for 30 some years to everybody I talked to. And that is the most powerful and effective question. And literally, you can all drop out of school and go be successful if you work 90 hours a week and ask everybody you run into that one question and listen. You don't have to do it, but listen. You'll be blown away at what you hear. And if you're sincere about it, you'll know more about what's going on in your company than anybody else in the company because they will all be happy to share. And they'll be way more supportive as you go in a different direction if you've at least asked them. Always be participative, but don't be consensus. If you wait for consensus, if you wait for everybody to agree that that's where you ought to go, everybody's going to already be there. And if everybody's there, they're bunkered in, and then you're trying to gain share as opposed to um, go to a greenfield and establish position. So um, I always I always like controversial strategies. If everybody thinks your strategy is is a good one, don't bother, because Everybody will be there. They will be. If you can't walk into an interview and say, so why should I hire you? And you say, well, I breathe. That's not very differentiable. Now, you want to be differentiated because if differentiation, you have pricing power. With pricing power, you have profits. With profits, you make money and you can hire more people and do more good things. The problem is you have to be controversial and correct because if you're controversial and wrong, you look really dumb. Um, obviously. Um, so anyhow, those are, those are some of the things that I've learned in, in, uh, uh getting started. Um, what else do I want to, oh, while you're here, a lot of your coworkers are sitting in the room. When you go start your company, be, make friends with everybody you can at San Jose State while you're here, especially the engineers, because they don't know what to do. They know how to do it. They just don't know what to do, right? So I, I would be hanging around the engineering table at lunch and hand, I saw somebody handing out chocolates. I'd be giving them chocolates and stuff, you know, just, you know, want some candy little engineer, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> go to the parties and stay sober and, and meet these guys. And, and, uh, and really, they're going to be hugely important to you. Learn how to sell. Business is all about selling. Everything is. When we started Sun, I had to sell people to put money into our company. We had to sell people to give us a cheap rent on the building. We had to sell people to sell us disk drives at the same price that IBM was buying them. We had to convince people to come work for us. We had to convince customers. It's all about sales. Take sell, sales classes. But there's a very simple, I can give you, I, I can save you from having to do that. You walk into somebody and say, can I have the order? They will say, no. You say, why? They will tell you, you write it down, you go away, you fix it, you come back and say, all right, I fixed it. Now can I have the order? They will say, no. You ask why? This sounds really simple, but people don't do this. But then you go back and fix that. After about seven times, they go, Oh my God. All right, you can have the order. Now get out of my office. But they will trust that you are listening, asking, and wanting to go do the right things and the best things for everybody. So that's an important um, um, message. And then uh, I, I could talk forever. I got about 4,800 little <laughs> tidbits that I'd be happy to share with you. But I did promise myself that I was going to give you all lots of time to ask lots of questions about a lot of topics. And uh, I will try to keep them on the record. Uh, 
just because my perspectives often are, um, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter and you, a lot of you will probably tweet what I'm saying or post on Facebook. I, I, somebody a long time ago said you have no privacy, get over it. So I have to sort of be careful, but you know, maybe in one-on-ones or whatever, I can be a little more open about what I truly believe. It's just not safe anymore, and that's a scary thing. I've got a wife and kids and um, a, a lot of uh, companies that I'm helping, and I don't want to. I don't want to be too obvious uh, for fear that it might damage their their dreams. So it's pretty pretty strange that a a guy in my position would feel intimidated, but uh, it's it's pretty intimidating, the, uh, the blunt uh, weapons that are used on uh, on people who are telling the truth sometimes. Anyhow, questions? So we'll take a mic around. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And, uh, okay. Any topic, any? Hi. What do you see as the current role of the entrepreneur, and how have you seen that change since you started Sun Microsystems? I, I think the, the role of an entrepreneur is creative and positive destruction of the dumb ways we're doing things now. And, you know, the Fortune 500 used to be a list that, and brands used to be very, very durable. When I, when I was growing up, Coca-Cola, Ford, and uh, General Foods were the big brands, right? And now you look at how quickly brands get created. I mean, it, used to, it took Coca-Cola 150 years to build its brand. And now you look at Google, Uber, Facebook, Tinder, all these other brands that everybody knows about, and they pop up so fast. And companies are um, popping up. The technology has the shelf life of a banana. CEOs have the shelf life of a banana. And businesses have the shelf life of a banana. I think things can go up. As fast as they go up, they can come down. And we've proven that, and it's happening. And, uh, you know, I, so I think creative destruction is absolutely imperative. I'm, as s- strange as you may think that Uber is being managed and their decisions, an Uber ride is still way better than a New York cab. So that's a huge, huge and positive creative destruction um, activity that's made life way, way better. Um, And there are so many things what Phil is doing in the insurance brokerage industry is is absolutely critical. And there are so many good things that can happen. Um, So the entrepreneur has always been that. I mean, I... My hero was Henry Ford. I grew up in the auto industry and loved cars, and I thought, wow, that guy, you know, the Model T, the assembly line, the production line, all the rest of it, that was, that was really great. It seems sort of simple, but, um, you know, and even, even the entrepreneur can do things just like miniaturization or cost reduction, that sort of thing. Those are all good things. Anything to lower the cost of delivery to... And you think about it, capitalism really helps the bottom half who can't afford to pay for the more expensive way of doing things. Cabs are more expensive. So if the government who makes money on the medallions prevents cabs from coming into their city, that's hurting the people who can't afford a driver or can't afford a cab. Um, So uh, I just think, as Phil said, this is how you bring... Uh, people out of poverty, and I think entrepreneurs are the. I was I was talking to the group a little earlier, and I I think it's an interesting thought process. You know, billionaires give a lot of money away, and sometimes I look at it, and having given a lot of money away, and with my dot org that I started trying to raise money from foundations, I think, oh my God, the money is so wasted. It's so poorly managed. It's so bureaucratic. There's so much money that is, you know, these. I think some of the great foundations would roll over in their grave uh, the, the the donors if they knew and I'll just throw some names out maybe potentially the Rockefeller Foundation or the Hewlett Foundation I think Bill Hewlett might roll over in his grave at some of the ways his money is being spent uh, and not spent because uh, it goes to the administration but imagine if Gates and Buffett 
had taken their $80 billion and rather than pledge to give it all away, they all pledged to give it away in two to $5 million checks to economics majors, MBAs, engineering, who have created a business plan for a startup when they graduate and they come to a board of reviewers like Phil or myself or um, other retired CEOs and we look at your business plan and we say, all right, where are your engineers? They show me your engineer. Where are your marketeers? Where, you know, where's your business plan? Let's see it. Let's read it. And if we like it, we tell Gates and Buffett, give them a $3 million check for half their company. Now take $80 billion divided by $2.5 million. How many checks would be written over the next couple of years to how many groups of students graduating from school to go start the next Uber, the next Facebook, the next Apple computer, the next Sun Microsystems. Imagine how much more quickly the common cold would be cured. We'd get cold fusion. We'd get perpetual motion machines. We'll get all of those things that, that will change our standard of living much faster. And because the foundation gets half of the next Facebook, that 80 billion will double and then triple and then quadruple. It's called capitalism. And by taking money out of the capitalist stream and giving it to charities uh. and or, and I'm not saying all charities are bad. I think there's a lot of very good investment and some of the stuff Gates is doing around eliminating malaria and other things are just things that government should be doing but they're too freaking incompetent to do. By definition, they're monopolies. The only wart in capitalism is monopoly. I studied antitrust. I wrote a thesis on it. When you hear our government say too big to fail, that means they're not doing their job. So what did Dodd-Frank do? It propped up the too big to fail banks. Instead of breaking them up like they ought to, and this is a little bit about economics, and we shouldn't, I presided over Sun when we had the largest antitrust lawsuit ever in the history of antitrust. $2.4 billion settlement against Microsoft for antitrust. And I felt bad about it. Why? Because Bill Gates was not a criminal. He was just doing what we're supposed to do. When you go to the dog race, that rabbit runs around the track in a cart, you know, someone could drive in a cart, and the dogs all chase it. And the dog who gets across the finish line wins. But if the dog actually got the rabbit, sat in the golf cart, and sped around so fast that the other dogs couldn't even um, see the rabbit, what would happen? The race would stop. The dogs would stop running. They'd start going in circles and fighting with each other, which is what happens when a monopolist gets so much market power. Now, what do you do? Do you go out and shoot the dog that was smart enough and fast enough to get in the cart? No. You bronze that dog and you put him out to pasture and you breed, right? I'm not saying we should do that with Bill Gates, but, but what the United States should have done with Microsoft, if they thought it was a monopolist, is bought the company and, get, and open sourced all their technology to all American companies. And there would have been a huge leap forward in productivity and standard of living and innovation and competition. And we should have bronzed Bill Gates and made him Secretary of Commerce. But instead we make it an illegal act. But anyhow, there is a war, it's called monopoly, and asking the government to do these things. So yeah, I would, I would, um, I, I'm not saying all charity and um, uh, good acts are bad. I'm just saying that should we do all 80 billion or shouldn't we and don't we want uh, the people who have money to put it into investment, consumption, savings, and charity in varying amounts because all of those can create to the good. Next question. I have one over here. You okay? So that's actually a perfect segue into uh, my question. Um, so we have Oracle today that uh, that was the, well, 
that guy a lot more. So Sun Microsystems was bought by, uh, by Oracle. Um, by all accounts, Oracle is a very large company, uh, tech industry. Uh, Intel is has taken a large share of the capital in uh, uh, in, in in silicon. Um, many other industries have uh, have gone to a maturity in technology, as as you've seen over the years. Um, where do you think that trend is going to be going in the next you know decade or so? Well, it's funny watching the Silicon Valley. It started off doing transistors. And then it started doing chips, and then it started doing boards, and then systems, and then it added spinning rust and did disk drives for a while, and and then it started doing operating systems, and then it started doing middleware, and then it started doing applications, and then it started doing cloud-based services. We kind of called it back in the 80s when we said the network is the computer. We just were a little ahead of our time at Sun. And so now you have, you know, the, almost everything is in the cloud. And uh, that really does obsolete a lot of things. If you notice um, who's buying and building the most computers, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's, it's the big cloud companies. And they're buying nothing from IBM, Hewlett Packard, Oracle, Sun, or any of those other folks. So the world is changing and it's just all part of the natural creative destruction. And... You know, I kind of get upset at the media when there's a layoff. Well, you know what? That means creative destruction is going on and we're reallocating resources to a better place. It's not a bad thing. Now, this creative destruction, everybody's worry is going to get out of control. So let's take Uber and driverless car and imagine what that does to how many jobs. It's actually pretty stunning. The number one job description in America is truck driver. They go away because all these Uber vehicles drive at night when, the, when there's no traffic and deliver everything at night. Um, at Ford Motor Company, there's a bunch of people called stylists. You don't need a stylist because when you call an Uber, do you ask for, you know, chrome fins and spinner wheels on your Uber? No, it's just Whatever shows up, you get in it and go. And then you think about, what is the utilization? How many of you own a car? Anybody own a car in here? What do you think your utilization is? 3% a year? Uh, 3% a week? If you're lucky? It's like your, it's like your PC. You know, you have very, very low utilization on your PC. Now imagine with Uber driverless car, these vehicles will get 60, 70, 80% utilization, maybe more. Now, what does that do to all of the auto supply industry and all the rest of it? It shrinks because there's not all of this capacity. And what happens when all of a sudden we don't have accidents because nobody's drunk or texting or falling asleep at the wheel or just not trained or doesn't know the rules? And what does that do to the insurance industry? Now, what does it do to the parking lots everywhere? Because these things don't, when you, Get all, you don't need as many roads, gas stations. I mean, it, it, the, whole, the whole infrastructure of that just changes everything. So now everybody's worried, oh, we'll have everybody who's unemployed. Well, no, if we have high minimum wage and we have regulations and we don't put our money into getting new startups, there's lots of stuff that needs to be done. Um, and there's lots of places that these people could be applied to more productive uses and safer uses. Uh, so that's, that's the big battle and, and the big worry. Now politicians are always trying to guard against the downside. Capitalists are always saying the downside is awesome. And nobody talks about the data dump. That was the company I started with Vinod Kosla, my other co-founder at Sun, that we started uh, about six months before we also started Sun. The data dump didn't make it. I lost all of the investor's money. <laughs> we used his money. Um, and I won't go into it. It was a mess. Um, but the same investor also invested in Sun. So he was batting 500 and he did all right. But, you know, they're not all going to work. And you learn from your mistakes. And getting reallocated is a good thing. Other question. It's it's mine in the in the back. You you have uh, 
no doubt negotiated pay packages for executives for a, a number of years. What, what do you think about the forces behind executive compensation? And are they, in your opinion, market-driven forces, forces from other mechanisms? And uh, do you think normatively that they're reasonable or unreasonable? Compared to baseball salaries, I think they're probably reasonable um, in, in that I think, you know, the productivity. I think there are definitely examples of baseball players who got overpaid and some who are underpaid uh, based on performance. I think it's, um, I think being a board member is a, is a very high order calling. I think shareholders, if you're going to invest in companies, ought to pay a little more attention to how the money is being spent uh, and what kind of return on assets you're getting. So I don't know a better system than the board of directors and the comp committee and public transparency to who's getting paid what. Um, and I think CEOs have more transparency about what they're making and what their investments are, what their conflicts of interest are. I, I always had to disclose where I had investments and that sort of thing. It's very different than... Uh, a, a newscaster who never discloses how they vote or who they who they donated to, which when I'm watching a newscast I'd, or what stocks they own, I'd sure like to know all of that history when I hear them tell me their interpretation of a particular event. So I think CEOs have far more transparency than uh, than uh, most most job titles, and I will also tell you that. CEOs matter. Um, when you go to work for a company, you want to try and meet the CEO and use your gut to try and figure out whether this person has integrity and character and wants to share in the success of the company or whether they want to hog it all, all the rest of it. CEOs really matter. And even more so the board, because if the CEO is not good, the board will see it, hopefully, if they're a good board and, and fix it. And uh, so, you know, top-down governance really, really does matter. Um, do I think companies overpay their CEOs? I don't know. I mean, that's an overbroad question. We can look at any specific example. and um, I think most people would have said I was wildly underpaid. Um, I didn't complain. I didn't care. I didn't even ask for I never asked for a raise. In fact, I used to give my stock options that they grant me to different employees inside the company. I didn't care, but I'm just weird. I'm a good capitalist. Larry Ellison's a great capitalist. He pays himself very well. <laughs> and he won the America's Cup. That's, those boats are expensive. But I'm happy. I'm okay. I sleep well at night. Um, and it just depends on who you are and what you are and what you're after and who you surround yourself with on the board. Uh, and then shareholders have a right. See, I, my view is shareholders can't complain because they can sell their stock. You have the ultimate, and, you know, we can complain all we want about baseball players getting overpaid. Well, you don't have to buy a ticket. You don't have to watch the show. And I think that's what's great. Now, if the government gets involved, we are hosed. Do you know where the, the hosed thing came from? It's Canadian. When you did pond hockey... Two teams would play, and the loser had to hose down the rink, the outdoor rink, with the with the hose, and and uh, that's how you get hosed. You lose. <laughs> so, nobody knows that, but it's yeah. kind of a neat little. Now you really learned something here. <laughs> so hopefully that answers the question. It's a tough question to answer, but yes. Uh, hello. Uh, what are your thoughts on net on uh, net neutrality? And the uh, the impact of that. Yeah, so net neutrality is classic government speak. They called it the Affordable Health Care Act when it was totally un unaffordable. And I used to have a list of about five of these things that they would call it, and they were exactly they, the the government names it exactly the opposite of what it is, so that it sounds good even though it's going to be a mess. And net neutrality is not about net neutrality; it's all about stifling innovation in the network. 
Because what net neutrality does is it allows freeloaders who don't spend money on the capital to put the networks up to use it at, without having to invest in the assets. What that's going to do is make people not invest as much in the network. So the telcos and the cable companies and all the others who have to make their networks available neutrally are going to say, well, I can't, I can't get a return on this. It's like price fixing. Now, everybody says we got to limit drug prices. Well, you know what that does? It kills people. When you hear price controls on drugs, it kills people. Because what the drug companies do, I know, I've been a CEO. If you can't charge the market value, you get less revenue. If you get less revenue, you don't make as much money. If you don't make as much money, you cut R&D. You cut R&D, you don't get the drugs. You don't get the drugs, people die. Nobody understands what I just said in the media when they're out there pounding the table. And net neutrality is price controls on the network. If you do price controls on the network, you will get slower and less available networks. It's just, it's like blindingly logical and inevitable that if you, can't, if you price control something, you're going to get a huge, huge reduction in uh, productivity and assets. So very simple economics question and uh, very important. But when you call it net neutrality, who doesn't want to be fair? Well, that's socialism. Life is not fair. The people who work 90 hours a week or the people who were born as smart as Andy Bechtelsheim and Bill Joy in our star, they're going to do better. That's just life. Get over it. We're, but I'll tell you what, the bottom half will do better in a free and open and capitalist society than the bottom half will do in a society. And that's the group you really care about. There are no socialist, communist bottom halves that do well compared to capitalist, democratic countries. It's just the empirical evidence. Go, just travel. I've been to probably 80 countries around the world. I've seen it all. And let me tell you, capitalism is way better. It ain't close. Free markets. And I coming back, to, I've been places where people don't have, and I, I know there's single issue voters, and California's got all kinds of people who are voting on social liberties and freedoms, meanwhile allowing rampant reduction in financial liberties and freedoms. Let me repeat, if you don't have financial liberties and freedoms, you will lose your social liberties and freedoms. That, that will happen. And in your lifetime, because I can't believe how much it's happened in my lifetime. And it's accelerating right now. It's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. Can you talk a little bit about um, privacy and security on the internet, both today and moving forward? Great topic. Um, somebody a long time ago said, you have no privacy, get over it. Oh, that was me. I said that back in the mid-90s. And it's probably my most famous outrageous quote. And... Uh, I've raised my boys by telling them, listen, everything you do at this point is a digital tattoo. There's a camera or a microphone or uh, uh, a storage device that keeps track of certainly everything that you input. And somebody's got their camera right now videoing me and what I'm saying. And it could go viral if I say exactly the wrong thing or even the right thing. It could go viral, and, and, and so you have to be very, very careful. You can't text or Snapchat. Snapchat is not safe. What was that one? Um, Ashley Madison, you know, that was safe for a while. <laughs> Why do you laugh? I always like to say those and then see who laughs about Were you a member? No, okay, just look it up. Um, so you just have to be very, very careful. It turns out that the newer generation just doesn't care about privacy as much as they should. And I don't care about privacy. The only organization I worry about with privacy is the government. Because if Google is doing something with my data I don't want them to do, I'll go to Yahoo. If AT&T is doing something I don't want them, I'll go to Verizon. I, in the private sector, I have choice. I can move around. 
And let me tell you, it can destroy a company. And uh, Equifax is taking it on the chin big time because of what they did. Now, what happens when the IRS has data on my particular .org or whatever? Who gets? Nobody ever got arrested or fined personally for the IRS scandal or for. And I, I was used to wondering in the Europe why did, were they more nervous about their government than they were about the bad guys on privacy? And you know the government didn't want encryption because then they could eavesdrop. And I thought, well, that's good. They're in law enforcement. But you know what? The government now isn't just in law enforcement and defense and State Department and judicial. They are now in health care. They are now in finance. They are now in loans and mortgages and student loans. They are in education. That's the scariest of all. We've got the government educating our children. And they want to get into... Um, child care and everything, they, they want to get in, at, at, they want to take your baby over at two. I want to keep my baby as far away from the government as possible. Because I want them not to, that's necessary tyranny. We have to have necessary tyranny in defense, in law enforcement, in state, in judicial. There are a bunch of things, and the bridge or whatever, there are a bunch of things that we have to have the monopoly, the inefficient, ineffective, whatever. Now, so the only place I really worry about privacy is what if the government knows how I vote? What if the government knows how, uh, uh, what I'm watching on TV? What if the government knows how, where I'm giving my money in charitable donations? What if the government knows all that stuff? And what if I then say I need a heart transplant? And they go, <laughs> Don't even think about it. <laughs> I, it sounds silly, but um, the corruption I see in our government is off the charts compared to before you were born, which I did see. When Nixon had 12 minutes of tape missing, he was gone. 30,000 missing emails, no big deal. Oh, I mean, I just, I, I, you just have to... I mean, you, you cannot imagine how different the world is from a corruption perspective. And, you know, you're seeing the absolute decay in Hollywood, and they've been brainwashing us forever. Fake news. I mean, the one thing I'll give Donald Trump credit for, because I, I was on the inside of a million stories in, in my business career. I was on the inside. I was in the meetings. I knew what happened, all the rest of it. And I used to say that 70% of what I read was accurate in those stories because I was there. The only problem is they didn't highlight the accurate parts. So you had to triangulate and all the rest of it and read lots of different sources to try and figure out what you think was really accurate. And you still have to do that. And so privacy... Um, I think we're just going to have to live with it. I think anonymity breeds irresponsibility. That's my phrase. I don't know if any other... But imagine you are invisible. Do you think you would live as civil a life? Do you think we'd have as civil a society if there were a bunch of people running around absolutely invisible? Do you think you would be alone in the bathroom? Do you think you'd be uh, able to secure your money? Do you think... You know, somebody couldn't cheat and steal your IP if they were invisible. And, and in a, so privacy is not an absolute. There has to be some access. I will tell you a story that petrified my wife. It made me a little nervous. We had just been married. I, was, I think we had a couple kids. And an anonymous remailer called, excuse my French, fuckedcompany.com was a place where people in different companies, they would have a little section, could do anonymous bitch sessions about their company. And there was a section on Sun, and one of my HR people watched it. I didn't even know about it. I said, hey, there's uh, DC Sniper and um, Charles Manson have been exchanging uh, texts on 
this website on the Sun section about how they were going to off Scott McNeely on November 28th. And they were talking about the kinds of bullets, where to buy them. In Mountain View has a store to get some 322 bullets. And it was all quite graphic and explicit and specific. And I looked on my calendar, and I'm supposed to be at Comdex in front of 10,000 people in a live auditorium giving a speech. Now, this privacy and anonymity, I called the FBI. We sell a lot of computers to the FBI. I said, can you help me here? They go, nope. It's an anonymous, we can't get in there, we don't, it's all encrypted. Well, what do you think I should do? He said, get protection. Oh, thanks. I thought that's what yeah. the FBI was. So I said to Susan, you know, I'm going to go give a speech. And she says, no. And I said, yes, I got it. I can't, I can't just let an anonymous terrorist threat. I mean, this was terror, terrorizing. It wasn't, who knows why they were terrorizing me, but um, I just got a flak jacket on and wore a baggy sweatshirt and I hired a guy with a gun to uh, escort me around and I asked him at the start, you know, would you take a bullet for me? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not for this amount of money. <laughs> Anyhow, I was real nice to him at the end of the day. I was kind of pleased. Um, he, I said, would you take a bullet for me now? He goes, I might take one in the foot. Here, <laughs> I thought that was nice. But anyhow, I just told everybody in the front row, if you see a red dot on my forehead, yell duck. Uh -huh. And I, I gave a speech. Fortunately, nothing happened. But, you know, anonymity can be very terrorizing. Very terrorizing. So um, it's, it's a tough balance. I'm mostly scared of absolute anonymity, and I'm mostly scared of um, the government knowing stuff about me, unless... There's no scope creep in the government. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really care that law enforcement knows about me. But if the same organization also does my health care and my education and my loans and all the rest of it, then I get nervous. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, nobody ever talks about it that way. Nobody. And you know who yells the most about we need privacy? The government. <laughs> does it work? Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, question. Since you started out, uh, like, you know, in the manufacturing side, then worked your way up, do you now have an appreciation for those people and the amount of hard work that they do? And especially since your company was manufacturing. Yeah. Um, the reason why, when I got my MBA, when I was working for Rockwell, I knew I worked in all of their factories. I knew everybody in the factory. I had been a foreman and worked alongside them. I knew every tool and die machine, everything. And so when I became a sales rep for Rockwell International, whenever there was a problem the customer had, I would call down and I would actually talk to the workers and say, hey, this die has the leading edge has obviously been sheared off. We need to fix it because we're getting some flash on this. And, and they would take care of me. If, if my customer needed stuff, I'd say, hey, can you schedule that in? And they would say, well, yeah, but it's... And I would go to my boss and I'd say, hey, they want to go do this, but I think it's more profitable for us to make this other customer happy, whatever. And I knew everybody in the factory. I, and I knew that starting off on the factory floor would make you know more about the product, more about the process, more about how it works. So when I got out of business school, I wanted to work on the factory floor. Nobody would hire me in a factory with a Stanford MBA and a Harvard undergraduate economics degree. I was too important to be on that was their attitude. It was so wrong. So my only job that I was able to get was manufacturing strategy for FMC Corporation. And then eventually I got them to move me out to the tank plant as a foreman in the tank plant. Actually, I was a materials uh, manager in the t But I was in the factory. We were making stuff. We tanks. That was the ultimate maker. Um, so... Yeah, and, and then when we started Sun Microsystems, my first two years, I was head of, head of operations. Uh, Vinod was uh, my other co-founder. He had been uh, head of finance for a little workstation company in technology. So he had two years business experience. Um, and so we had an argument about who was going to be the CEO. And I said, you do it. I don't you know, I'm just learning what a disk drive does, and you've been in technology, and you've got an engineering degree, UBC, and it goes, no, no, you do it, you do it. We had this big fight, and finally I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Dad worked too hard. I'm not going to work that hard. 
So he took over. He got fired two years later, and they asked me to take over temporarily. So, you know, talk about accidental empires. And uh, I promised the board that I would quit as soon as they found a replacement. They found a replacement 10 months later. My staff voted 11 to nothing. We don't want the new guy. We want to stay with Scott. And an investor found out that we were going to bring this guy in, and they canceled their commitment to invest $20 million in the company. They came out, did the interviews, and they went into the board and said, either Scott stays the CEO or we're not going to make the investment, and we won't have a five-year veto vote on any new CEO. And so the board called me in and said, will you stay on? And I went home, had dinner with my mom, and I said, I didn't want to work this hard. I wanted to be a good number two. I didn't want to be the leader. And the, she says, oh, i just do it for a year or two. And then 22 years later, I, my boys were two, four, six, and eight. And my wife um, said, I don't totally understand little boys because she had a sister. And uh, so I stepped down um, and uh, decided I was going to spend a lot of time with four little startups and let me tell you, I do not regret that at all. You know, I got married late, got my trophy wife um, at the age of 39, and uh, I have uh, four pretty outstanding uh, young men that uh, are a little bit fish out of water here in California, but they're they're uh, they're tough. Um, so thank you for the fantastic presentation that you're able to just come out and give us today, for starters. Um, I actually have a question about R&D. So what do you believe is the value and the commitment that a company should bring to a table or to society in regards of investing in R&D? Well, so um, I always talked about strategic partnerships with other companies and people overuse that word. But I always said, listen, it's not a strategic partnership unless there's some R&D involved on both sides where there's some real work, some real invention. And we always built a business model to spend anywhere from 8 to 13% of sales in R&D. And we had a lab, and we had a very, that's another conversation we can follow. I'll tell you how we structured our lab. We probably had the most productive lab in the world, and there were only 100 people in it. And we created Spark and whole pieces of Solaris. Java came out of our labs. Genie, a whole bunch of products that are today running the clouds that you see out there were invented out of it. And I just think that um, we did we did real R and D. We didn't do research. We did more development kind of R and D. You know, Bell Labs used to do real research. Um, and there's a lot of companies that buy other people's R and D. Oracle bought it and then killed it and then moved everybody over to their stuff. That was their strategy and they've done that with hundreds of companies. Microsoft would buy it and bundle it into Office or Windows and then charge monopoly prices for that. Um, Cisco bought lots of, every one of their little competitors and then created the hairball called iOS. <laughs> um, and, and you know that worked great for a while, but eventually the hairball of their networking infrastructure has basically put a damper on their growth. But there's different, you know, different ways. We, we didn't do a lot in acquisition. We just tended to invent a lot of stuff, mainly 10 years too early. We did wearables too early. We used to have Google Glasses decades before Google did it. We, we did cloud computing before anybody, we called it the network as a computer, now everybody calls it cloud. Uh, we did open source, you know, we invented open source. That sounds a little Al Gore-ish, but uh, um, <laughs> I, can actually, I can actually give you a pretty good use case that we did that. So um, I, I think R&D is what makes the world go around. It's the invention. I will tell you, um, I met with the CEO, uh, the, the head of Stanford University, John Hennessy who was a founder at SGI, one of our competitors. And I asked him, I said, give me your one sentence mission statement for Stanford. And he said something that I thought was very excellent and profound and interesting and on the button. He said, we want to be at the intersection of healthcare and technology. And if you want my advice, one or the other or both are places I would go if, if you want to be in a place that's going to be fun, interesting, dynamic, important, useful. And for those of you who have ever had 
a friend or a relative or whatever or a loved one that has a health care problem, you know, what's more important than your health? So I think that's R&D in that space is just going to take off and it's going to be a, a good thing. One last thing I will say. Are we getting close? Uh, we have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, I can do a couple more questions. Okay, then. I have a question. Sure. I've been listening with fascination to your talk, and I'm wondering, um, my perception is that you and Phil are anomalies in CEOs and managers in Silicon Valley, people who respect the market that made them what they are. And I'm wondering, is that a misperception, or what, what's happened to, if it's not, what happens to uh, executives once they make it along the market system and they forget about it. I think that has to do with California and Northern California and this. I mean, this, we have a super majority across the board. There are no capitalists elected in California, none. I mean, it is staggering. I mean, nobody even campaigns here. The only thing they do is they try to fundraise because there's an occasional capitalist who will actually give money for some races in some other place. But the, basically, the capitalists have given up on California, just given up. They lost my son. He immediately moved to Summerlin, Nevada before he signed his deals. As it just It just doesn't make sense. Um, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I just think it's because people want to be loved. I don't need to be loved. You, you can all hate me for what I said. There's probably a few people who left because they didn't want to hear what I was saying. I'm sure there are people who had other good reasons to. I'm okay with that. But I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share a, a dissenting view on, on what makes the world go around here. Now, do I have a heart? You have to ask my friends, my family, people who know me, and people who I, I give no money away anonymously. I don't do it with my name on it. I don't want people to think I'm a nice guy because that doesn't matter. I want my family and my friends to think I'm a nice guy. And I want to go to sleep thinking I'm a nice guy. That's all that matters to me. You know what? You can all hate me. I just want to, I want to go to bed and sleep well knowing I moved the ball forward in a lot of ways. I have a charity. It's called Curriki, and you you can get a card. I would like you to grab a card and just evangelize it if you know a school teacher. It's a free and open website with over 250,000 K through 12 learning assets on it. We've taken curriculum and we've open sourced it. I've had donations from all around the world. India is neck and neck with the U.S. in terms of the largest user. But what I want to do is I want to take this Lego bucket of free and open source learning Lego blocks. There's full curriculums, there's textbooks, there's worksheets, there's science projects, there's con videos, there's everything you can imagine on it. We want to assemble that all, and we're taking money from donors uh, and organizations and building Lego cars and train stations like sixth grade math, seventh grade social studies, you know, European history, and we're building out these online curriculums, and I want to build out Legoland, which will be a free, online, open source, on-demand, real-time scored, multimedia, web-enabled, internationalized, localized, certified K-12 experience for every parent, teacher, or child, homeschooler, you name it, so that it's not no child left behind, but it's no parent, teacher, or student held back. And I think that will, it's my little deal. Um, everybody says take it public because if you look at the growth numbers, it looks like a dot-com superstar. It looks like a, what do they call them, the unicorn? Mm -hmm. And they say, make it private charge for it. And I go, no. Every kid ought to have an opportunity to get at this stuff free. Schools don't have any money. Everybody breaks their pick on because the government sector has totally destroyed the education business for K-12. through Just destroyed it. It is so last millennium, you can't believe it. So the only way I know how to do this is keep it free and get capitalists. There's another big donor to, to Kariki right here in the corner who understands the power of this thing. All of you could have finished high school by the time you were 14 in this room. I can say that unequivocally. Maybe sooner if you'd have had Legoland. 
with real-time scoring, and you could see how quickly you were climbing the charts. And this is gamification for a good thing, not for game of kill them or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you all blow them up. Uh, so, uh, so a quick follow-up question. Is there a future in California for our students here? Should they follow your son? I would, rec I would recommend that you go interview um, in other geographies. And I don't mean New York or L.A. Go into the heartland and go just try it out. My son is renting in Summerlin, the nicest neighborhood in the Las Vegas area, a three-bedroom, two-bath, in laundry, full kitchen, two car attached garage in a gated community, 1700 bucks a month. And they don't have bugs there either. <laughs> and every country western act comes through Vegas every year. It's, there's no bad restaurants in Vegas. I mean, it's just, it's, it, and they have a hockey team, a football team's coming. And they're uh, negotiating to get a basketball team. So, next question. Um, so going back to like the idea of free speech and like being able to having a dissenting opinion on college campuses. Um, after the whole Milo debacle, debacle at Berkeley, Donald Trump issued a statement saying that any public university that received federal funds that prohibited it and. Um, didn't help enable free speech should be defunded. What are your thoughts on that statement? I, I, you know, Obama went and put this Title IX or whatever that thing was, um, thinking about that, and he said, if you don't do that, you lose federal funds. Trump is now saying it about his little particular issue. I don't think government should be giving any colleges money. They should be private institutions, and they should be run and competitive that way. And I don't think CEOs should be running around doing their own little thing by playing. I think both of them are out of control. But the government's out of control. And um, I don't like redistribution because I think that the worst thing you can do for somebody's self-esteem is give them something they didn't earn. I think it's terrible. Do you realize 70% of the federal budget is redistribution? Taking money from somebody who earned it and giving it to somebody who didn't, so that the, the government official can buy votes to stay in power. It's absolutely wrong. Now, what is the right percentage of Phil's earnings that you think, what's the right percentage to take and give to other people who didn't earn it? Just tell me what that number ought to be. What is the fair amount of his money to take and give to somebody else? That's a really, really unfair question. And by the way, as Thomas Sowell, somebody was quoting Thomas Sowell, he says, you know, if they're going to take, if you're going to vote to have them take money from somebody to give to you, just don't be upset when that, that same government takes money from you and gives it to other people or even themselves, which is what is really aggravating about what's going on. So I, I, I am just a right and free speech is a right, is something you can give everyone without taking from anyone. Remember that. Free speech is a right. The right to own a house. Th those are rights. A house is not a right. Health care is not a right. Education is not a right. Because you have to take my secretary, great lady. She doesn't have any kids. She's paying for other people to have kids and go to school. That doesn't seem fair to me. I, now, if you want to say we should do redistribution for education, well, where are the biological parents? And why aren't they taking care of their kids? And why did they have so many kids? I, my my nine-year-old, when Obama won his second term, I think he was 11 maybe, he was driving in the car with me to school and he's crying. I mean, we were... We're good friends. I've known, I, I went to the same high school that Romney went to, and I grew up in Michigan. My dad worked for George Romney. Um, 
And so we've known the Romneys, and I've worked with him when he was governor of Massachusetts. We were the second largest employer there, and worked with him in the Olympics. And I've known him forever, and he was a family friend. And during his campaigns, we held fundraisers, and we had him at the house, and my boys got to meet him and his wife. And I mean, there's no better human than Mitt Romney in terms of anybody we've ever had a chance to vote for. It's like blindingly obvious, and he lost in a landslide to uh, Barack, and on the way there, uh, to school, he's crying in the back seat. And I said, Scout, what are you crying for? He says, how did Mitt lose? How could he possibly lose? I said, well, the, the socialist view is that if there's a single mom, has a couple kids, she has to work, she ha has to hire uh, daycare, she can't travel, doesn't have a lot, therefore it minimizes her work career opportunity. You take money from us, because we can afford it, and you give it to her so she can buy hockey equipment and pay the fees so that her kids can play hockey like you do. Hockey is a very expensive sport. So it doesn't change our lifestyle, and uh, her kids get an opportunity to play hockey. I was trying to help him stop crying and giving the Bernie Sanders explanation. You know what my little boy said, unprompted? He said, Dad, she chose to have those children. Game, set, match. Uh, you know, the, now you can say my kid doesn't have a heart, but you know what? He does have a heart because he says, you know, if you're going to have kids, take care of them. And so there shouldn't be any government money going to the, the and, and if you want to get more R&D, lower the corporate tax rate because then you'll get R&D that's focused on things that ought to be have. I got, I got really nailed because I retweeted an article by the LA Times about the huge amounts of subsidies going to Tesla. And all of the Elon Musk lovers and shareholders just bombed me on Twitter for how could you dare retweet that? You know, and they started like assaulting me and my career and track record in capitalism. Well, I love Steve Jobs. He never went to the government. I could never work for him. Crazy guy. I mean, just, oh, man, I got a million stories I could tell you about that, but you'll have to invite me back to do some of those stories. But Elon Musk has three businesses that are totally subsidized by taxpayer redistribution. That's SpaceX, almost all government money, his solar business, which is subsidized, and there is up to $40,000 per super luxury car Tesla's that I look at and I go, how can you be proud of that? Yeah, the government's a bunch of idiots. They're a bunch of corrupt. I mean, they are. They just, they can't help themselves. There's good people in the government. And there are hugely, I'm not an anarchist. There are hugely valuable. I love the police department. I love the fire department. I love our defense department. It doesn't mean they don't have $400 hammers, but I don't want to do without them. And, and so I just don't think the government should be in the education business at all. And then we wouldn't have this noise from either side. Sorry for the long answer there. It was a perfect answer and a perfect presentation. We want to thank one you. One quick so one I want to Go leave. Ahead. The one quick, last piece of advice is the most important decision you will make in your business career and in your life and one that they never teach you at school, they never train you or whatever, is who you're going to have babies with. I used to think it was who you got married to, no, because you can get divorced and it's fine. It's when you start to, and for those of you who don't have children, you probably don't understand what I'm saying, but trust me, once you have that magical moment where you hold your kid in, in your arms, your life is, in inextricably entwined with who is the other biological parent and um, really do the interview. You spend way more time and way more rational thought interviewing your VP of engineering in life than you do. <laughs> so when you meet somebody that you think, go meet their crazy uncle, go meet the parents, see the brothers, look in their... Genetics drive an enormous amount of stuff here. 
an enormous, and nobody wants to talk about it, but it, there's latent, you, it may not show up in your spouse, but it may show up in your kid. Just go check out the family and really, really think about, do I want to grow old and do I want to spend every Christmas or whatever with this person? There's no, and by the way, your career will be better if you choose the right person because they will be supportive of whatever you want to be doing. Uh, and beware the two career family. It's so hard and it's hard on the kids. I mean, we had a one career family and I found it was hard on the kids with me traveling so much. And, and then the last thing I will say, which is incredibly um, politically different, um, have lots of kids. You all are super bright. You are to those who much is given, much is expected, but it is also important for you to go, no, I know there's a lot of zero population growth folks here, but you will raise great kids. Have them, take care of them, and uh, they'll be the best startups you can go do. It's kind of a strange way to finish a talk but uh, on economics, but I think economically it'll be good for the planet if you all do that. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it.